And there's just something really satisfying about seeing rich people get taken down. I have seen a couple of videos around of people saying, if you like this TV show or this movie, then you should check out this book. And I thought it'd be fun to do my own version of that, just to show some of the books that I've read and also some of the TV shows that I have watched. It's a win-win for everyone because you might discover a new book or you might discover a new TV show. I've grown up on TV shows all my life. That's pretty much why my sense of humor is probably not that great. And it's also why my sense of vision is not that great. So would it be only fitting for me to mention that Glasses USA is sponsoring this video. So if you end up reading on your ebook or watching from a TV screen, you're probably gonna need glasses. What better way to check them out than from glassesusa.com? They offer over 6,000 styles and frames, including prescription glasses, which is really important because I am blind as a fucking bat. They have a mixture of in-house brands and designer brands like Ray-Ban and Gucci. You can pretty much find any style or color that you want on the site because they literally have everything, including sports glasses, safety glasses, glasses, kids glasses, and blue light glasses, which are the kind that I have. When you are looking at a screen, whether it's a TV or an ebook reader, the blue light helps block out those harmful lights. I'm wearing a pair that I got most recently. This is the Atoto Danielle in rose gold. This is a cat eye frame with a twist of retro. I got a couple other ones like the Atoto Meow. Yes, that is actually <laughs> the name of it. This one is more round, but it still has that touch of cat eye, which is why I picked it. I think this one is super cute and it matches with my hair color. This one is Atoto Telin. No. This is a round frame with a classic brow line. I would wear this if I finally dyed my hair pink or if I wore pink in my outfits. Lastly, if I don't want to wear any kind of color at all and I want to keep it really simple, I got the Atoto Smith. This is a very sleek and modern frame and it's very useful if I don't want to draw any attention to big ass frames or loud colors. I'll link all these glasses in my description below and you can go to the general link if you just want to get a special offer on your first pair of glasses. A complete pair of them starts only at $30. That's both the frames and the lenses, and free prescription lenses are included in every frame. There's free shipping and returns, 100% money back guarantee, and a 365 day product warranty. So thank you to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video, and now let's talk about how certain TV shows can be your gateway to reading more books, or vice versa, where you can check out a show. The first show I want to talk about is actually a show that I discovered this year, and that is Killing Eve, which is a British black comedy drama. It's a spy thriller that focuses focuses on two leading women. One of them is Sandra Oh. She is a British intelligence investigator and she is charged with the task of capturing a psychopathic assassin killer named Villanelle. In the beginning, Sandra Oh is used to working a desk job and she feels very bored with her day-to-day -day life and she secretly wishes to be a spy. Villanelle is also pretty bored with her boring assassin life, you know, just gets tired and killing the same kind of people every day. She's been murdering a whole bunch of people all across Europe. So Sandra O's agency is like, okay, listen, we gotta track down this murderer. And so it begins a story where they go all around Europe trying to track each other down. But then the weird thing is they kind of develop this obsession with each other that borderlines on romantic slash sexual. It's so fun to watch it develop because they're supposed to kill each other. But then every time you watch them make prolonged eye contact with one another, you're like, wait a minute. Wait a fucking minute, this feels kinda gay. Do they wanna kill each other or do they wanna bang? I don't even know, it's probably both. And that's pretty much the main appeal of the story. There's so many different locations that they go through that is cool to see, but it's really the sapphic sexual tension between them where you're like, oh my God, I feel like I need to get a room, just leave you two alone. If you also enjoy this show, then a book that I think you would really, really like is another book that I discovered this year, which is This Is How You Lose the Time War. This is a side sci-fi novella about two rival agents. Both of them are tasked with time traveling to different time periods and locations in order to secure victories for their respective warring factions. One day, one of the spies decides to drop a letter behind for the other spy. And this letter is basically boasting about how they won and they were able to trick them. But then the other person gets kind of intrigued and they decide to leave their own letter back for them in another time period. So you go through this entire book in different time periods, in different geography, 
biographies where they leave letters in the most creative places ever, like carving a message inside the ridges of a tree that takes 100 years to even decode what the message is, or having a letter that doesn't show up unless you dunk it in like a specific type of water. Over time, they develop a bond through the letters that they send to each other, even though they are supposed to be their enemies. This is another sapphic story that I thought was super well done. The writing is pretty much the most beautiful writing style that I have read in a book so far. There's this sense of intimacy that builds up between these two female characters. And it's a very similar way in that tingly feeling that you get watching Sandra Oh and Jodie Comer have super thick sexual tension with one another in a scene. I think both stories could be enjoyed because they are both essentially a cat and mouse game between two female protagonists. The fun part is just seeing the buildup of the attraction between them and just thinking, uh, what's going on? Are these bitches gay or what? And they are. They so fucking are. There's so much yearning and obsession between the two. And it's like, bro. The next show I'm going to mention is Once Upon a Time. This is a fantasy adventure drama that follows two different settings. One of them is a fantasy world where fairy tales exist, and the other is the real world that takes place in a seaside town. What you find out is that the characters in the real world are actually the fairy tale characters from the fantasy world. They were transported to this real world town and had their memories completely wiped out by the evil queen. They've been living there for years, they have never aged, and they are completely unaware of what is going on. And the plot begins when the main character, Emma Swan, who is Snow White's daughter, finds out that she is the savior who can break the curse and replace everyone's memories. You get to see them interacting in the real world along with flashbacks of what happened in the fantasy world. I never finished the show beyond the first few seasons because that show was just such a mess. Like it got way too convoluted for my taste. So I never finished it, but I will say that the appeal of that kind of show was just seeing how all these different fairy tales that that you recognize get interlaced together in one cohesive story. What I think would be a book or perhaps a series for you to check out if you enjoyed that show is The Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. This is a young adult fantasy series. It is very, very light sci-fi, so it's super accessible. It's basically futuristic retellings of fairy tales that you know, namely Cinderella, Red Riding Hood, Rapunzel, and Snow White. Each book covers a different fairy tale, but you get to see how the characters become related to one another in one bigger plot. The main character is Cinder, who is a teenage cyborg because she is half human and half machine. She has to deal with a wicked stepmother and she has to start a rebellion against this evil queen, enlisting the help of the other characters that you get to see in the future books. This is a really cool twist to the fairy tales because it gives more of a sci-fi and futuristic spin to it. If you love Once Upon a Time, I think you would also love the Lunar Chronicles because you would feel the same kind of joy from seeing how different fairy tales get pieced together, from seeing how the different characters from those different fairy tales interact with one another for a bigger cohesive plot. More cohesive than the show in my opinion, but you know, that's a whole nother rant altogether. The point is both stories modernize fairy tales in some way and they give like an interesting twist to them. Plus there's an ensemble cast in both of the stories because you're combining all these different fairy tales together, which means that you're bound to like at least one character. There's also lots of couples in the book series, just like in the show. Every book that you read in the four book series has as a couple for you to root for. So it has that blend of magical whimsy and romance and all the other kind of elements that I think anyone who likes Once Upon a Time would enjoy from the Lunar Chronicles. The next show I'm gonna cover is another one that I discovered this year, which is Insecure. This is a comedy drama starring Issa Rae, who is most famous for the web series that she made, Awkward Black Girl. The show follows two female protagonists. The main character, Issa, works at a nonprofit where they try to help out students of color and under privileged students. She's struggling to pull the sparks back together in her relationship with a long-term boyfriend who has kind of given up on life since his startup job failed and she's really struggling to rekindle the romance while she has roaming eyes for another dude. The other protagonist is Molly who is a successful corporate lawyer who has a lot of career success but a lot of difficulty with dating men in general. These two have been best friends since their college days in Stanford and they form a bond with each other for their own struggles that they share with one another. It's ultimately a 
show that aims to provide the black female experience. It shows how these women in their late 20s navigate their careers and their relationships and all of their other life issues. Some of them are external, some of them are internal, some of them are social and racial issues, and some of them are just really minor, inconvenient, awkward experiences. So it's like the full range. Particularly with the main character, there's so many awkward moments with her. She's really frustrated with being the token black girl at work and she vents out her frustrations by rapping to the mirror. She gets in a lot of awkward situations and then she commiserates with her other best friend who is also bumbling around with all these dudes that ain't shit. A book that I think does a similar thing is actually Queenie. This is written by Candace Cardi Williams. It is a contemporary and chick lit book. Instead of LA, this takes place in London and this follows a Jamaican British woman who has difficulty straddling the lines between those two cultures and never quite fitting in. She works at a national newspaper and she is also surrounded by a lot of white co-workers who she often compares herself to. She has a long-term boyfriend that she is also dealing with relationship struggles. The book chronicles her dealing with her breakup with that long-term boyfriend and really spiraling in her life as she has to confront her lack of self-worth and how she seeks all these men for approval and the constant questioning of what she actually wants in her life. The book covers a lot of mental health topics. It also dives into the way that we internalize racism and how we can learn to love ourselves as women of color or black women specifically. Both stories are similar in the sense that it gives you a modern day look at the experience of what it's like to be a black woman struggling to live in today's society, struggling with all of the microaggressions and cultural stigma. Not only do they struggle with systemic and external issues, but they also have personal problems of their own, like ex-boyfriend drama, fitting in at work, feeling good enough, and also just feeling fucking awkward. That's a very common theme between the two protagonists of these stories as well. Another common theme is that both protagonists are so deeply flawed. Both of them just keep on making choices throughout their respective stories where you're just like, girl, what the fuck are you doing? Like you just shake your head as you watch them spiral downwards, but you can't even hate them for it because that's just how life be. I think that's the appeal of watching or reading stories with dysfunctional female main characters because it just normalizes it for me and it makes me feel like, okay, so if I'm a fuck up, it's okay because like everybody's a fuck up. So I think there is a sense of being relatable even despite ultimately your flaws that make you have terrible decisions. But you know, you kind of root for them and you hope for the best for them and that you hope they learn. So you're in this together with them. It's not escapism because you know all too well what those situations are like. The next show I'm gonna cover is actually a reality show that was released on Netflix and that is Queer Eye, which is the reboot of another show called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Netflix decided to bring it back. They decided to broaden it so that those people weren't just helping straight men, but also a variety of other people like women or non-binary people. In each each episode, the group visits one person that was picked for the show and they are tasked to giving them a lifestyle makeover. Each person in this Fab Five group that they are called has a specific role for different parts of your life that you need to maintain. So one of them specializes in food and wine. He teaches you how to cook and make proper meals and nutritious meals for yourself. The other one is an interior designer and helps give you a home makeover so that you can live in a healthier space. Another one is a fashion designer that gives you a new wardrobe that suits your body type and your preferences unless you express yourself authentically. In my opinion, the best looking one is the culture expert, even though his job is kind of vague. He's kind of like in the miscellaneous category where he gives you general life advice. I think a lot of it is like internal work where a lot of times the people that they are trying to help have internal issues of their own that aren't just solvable through a makeover on the outside. So he's there to boost them up and make sure that they have a healthy self-esteem and learn to love themselves and learn to treat others kindly and treat themselves kindly. And then the last member is my favorite one, Jonathan Van Ness. They focus on hair and skincare and they just have the most infectious personality. It's so cheesy and campy, but I love to watch it anyway. It's just so positive and pure and wholesome. They really try to go beyond just the external changes of having a house makeover or a wardrobe makeover and really try to show the lesson of learning to take time to care for yourself, learning to be more confident 
confidence and embrace who you are authentically. So a similar book that I think could be compared to this is All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. He is a prominent journalist and LGBT plus activist who has put together this collection of personal essays. All these essays explore his childhood and his adolescence to even his college years. A lot of the themes that Queer Eye covers throughout their show, like toxic masculinity, gender identity, structural marginalization, is also covered in the essays from George's experiences with those. The author puts himself in the place of a friend and a mentor who is talking directly to you as the reader and tries to give you the lessons that he has learned throughout his life. Both of these forms of media give that sense of compassion and care and support and comfort. Both of these people have put themselves in the position of role models, but they're role models in the sense where they are still soft and gentle, but that's what makes them empowering. So if you really dig the message of Queer Eye, I think that you would also really enjoy All Boys Aren't Blue. And then the last show that I am going to cover is actually one of my favorite shows of all time, and that is Leverage. This is a heist show that has been described as a modern day Robin Hood because you have a team of criminals who have banded together to use their skills to fight corporate or governmental injustices. So basically taking down the rich bad guys and stealing their money so that they can give it back to the poor people who were taken advantage of by the rich people. The show is so campy and you can tell that it's pretty dated if you watch it today. I still liked it though because it didn't take itself seriously. It was still smartly written with how they pulled off all the heists and there's just something really satisfying about seeing rich people get taken down. The leader is a former insurance investigator that gets roped in to kind of babysit all of the other criminals but he kind of becomes like the father figure to them. There's a thief, there's a hacker, there's a hitman and then there's also a grifter who is usually the very charismatic person that's able to swindle you and you don't realize it until it's too late. Each episode follows a formula where there's a plan to pull off this heist and then things go really bad but then it turns out that they knew it was going to happen all along and they had predicted it ahead of time and they pull like a reverse uno on the bad guy and just finesse their ass and it's so fun to watch. So the book that I would connect for this show is The Gilded Wolves by Roshani Chokshi. This is a young adult fantasy that takes place in 1889. The main character is offered an inheritance but in order to acquire that he has to put together a band of people that you wouldn't normally see together. It's basically another high story but those are always so fun to read about. The main guy is the mastermind. His love interest is a dancer with a mysterious past. So she's more of like the grifter because she can seduce your ass and then try to finesse you. There's also experts of different fields that are in their team, like an engineer and a historian. So they use their different skill sets in order to pull off their heights. A question that I know people are going to ask is why I'm not connecting this show to Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. But the reason why I'm choosing this specific book to connect with Leverage is actually because of the themes I feel like are stronger connected to what Leverage was trying to do in their modern day setting. The story of the Gilded Wolves was actually inspired by a human zoo that was hosted in Paris in 1889. The existence of that human zoo during that time period shows that even though we view that specific time as this glitzy and glamorous time period of the Moulin Rouge era and aesthetic, there was actually a lot of messed up shit going on like colonization and racism, colorism, anti-Semitism, all the other fun isms. So the great thing about the characters that you follow in the Gilded Wolves is that they are specifically characters that would otherwise be on the sidelines of history. A lot of their heist involves acquiring certain artifacts. There's pieces of history that is interwoven throughout the book, which gives the story of them stealing a deeper layer because they're not actually stealing. They're stealing back what was originally theirs. It has that theme of colonization, giving justice to the people who were taken advantage of, like the colonized or marginalized groups. This is a very similar sentiment to Leverage because that group of characters specifically targets people who are in positions of power, people who are in positions of privilege, who have taken advantage of those who are less fortunate and trying to reclaim the money or the reputation or whatever that was stolen in the first place. Even though Six of Crows is a high story and it also features a found family similar to the way that Leverage does, I think that The Gilded Wolves is a more appropriate choice to make that comparison because it has that deeper layer. You still have your high story. You still have your found family with the ensemble cast. You still have the very angsty leader who has to be the mastermind and keep the group shit together, but he can't keep his internal shit together. So those are my five TV show and book pairings. Hopefully you have found a TV show or a book that you might be interested in checking out. Before I end this video, I do 
owe some shout outs because every time I hit a subscriber milestone, I give a shout out to a small booktuber. Last time I did this, I had 210K. Now I had 230K, which means that I owe two shout outs. The first shout out will go to Sarah from Star Maiden Reads. She is an Egyptian booktuber who is currently studying neuroscience and French. She's one of the co-hosts for the Bibliophiles Book Club, which is a book club that is focused specifically on characters who are bisexual. Her videos cover the booktube staples that you would see like wrap ups and TBRs and hauls. She is now branching off into K-pop. One of her videos was like almost an hour long because she opened like over 20 BTS albums. So if you are also a huge K-pop fan, then I think that you would really enjoy her content. The next booktuber I'm gonna shout out is Reagan, who has not posted in like three months, but I'm hoping that if I shout her out, then that will kind of push her to post more often. But she's really fucking funny. If you love Madeline Miller, she has a vlog where she basically cries over a song of Achilles. Her reading vlogs are super fun to watch. Other than that, she has a couple of TBR videos. And if you are a Glee fan, I think she has like two videos of that where one of them is her ranking the Glee songs. So it's a fun time. Check out both of these two and unsubscribe from my channel instead. Goodbye. I want for somebody